Hey, welcome back, everybody. Our last speaker for the day is Jared Norman, founder of Supergood Software. We're very excited to hear his talk. Jared, take it away. Thanks, Sean. So, uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Last one, last one of the day here. Uh, just as a heads up, I, I can't see chat just because of how how Keynote works. So uh, if you have questions, save them for after, and you can use the chat to just viciously mock me uh, since I won't be able to see it. The only other thing is that uh, I live right next to a helicopter landing pad. So if I suddenly mute, uh, that is because I'm sparing you from the audio of a helicopter landing less than 100 meters away. So I'm Jared. Um, and this is uh, a bit of an exciting Solidus comp for me because it is the uh, it's the first one since I've joined the the Solidus core team, and and because of that, I figured it'd be a good time to sort of uh, formally introduce myself to to the broader community. Uh, this is this is what I look like on the internet most of the time. Um, uh, I as you can see, uh, I have more hair currently, and in that photo, I'm starting to grow a very very bad mustache, but. Uh, uh, and, and I'm not actually as grumpy as, as the picture uh, makes it seem. Uh, I'm also uh, I'm a Canadian, uh, and as such, I necessarily play hockey. Uh, it's required by law, but I'm, I'm not actually very good at it. Um, uh, I've been programming since I was about 10 years old. I wanted to make games, and uh, by my mid-teens was, was actually making them. Um, it took me a long time to figure out that uh, it was... That, uh, that software development was actually something you could make money doing. Um, uh, but I figured it out eventually, and uh, next year will be uh, 10 years for me uh, as a professional software developer. I've, I've also been in the Solace community for quite a long time. Um, these are some, some photos I took in 2015. They, they, are, they were taken uh, at Whistler at the first informal Solace conf, um, despite the uh, focused faces of the people in the photo. Um, the everyone was very, very excited and at, at kicking off the project. And it was a really exciting time. We just uh, we were at Stumbolt and we just um, decided to partner with Bonobos to kick off the the new the new fork of Spree. And uh, I'm also lucky enough to have been able to attend every single Solidus Conf uh, since then as well. Um, since we kicked off the project, it's been uh, a really, a really interesting journey for me. At at Stemvolt, I got the opportunity to work on all kinds of different projects: Spree projects, Solidus projects, broader e-commerce projects, building things like payment platforms. But when when Jewel acquired Stemvolt, I chose to to sort of stick with the community uh, and started my own company, and that's that's super good software. Um, we we've been carrying forward the the good work that we've been doing at Stumble with Solidus and, and continuing to work with e-commerce businesses to make the, the most of the platform. That That's a whole journey on, uh, on its own that I could talk about, but over the past couple of years, we've, we've grown uh, our team to up to, we're a 10 person company now and we're, we're still growing. And uh, we've got lots of former STEM bolters as well as lots of new faces. And, and that sort of brings us to the topic uh, that I'm talking about today, agile fluency in e-commerce. So through this journey, uh, I've worked with all kinds of different teams and, and seen them grow and, and seen them uh, adjust their processes as they grow and, and improve how they work. And I, I, I've, I've learned a lot about what does and doesn't work uh, in the space. So one thing is that almost every team I've worked on, starting from before I even worked at Stemvolt, uh, they all sort of, in some sense, were were doing agile development. Um, now, despite the impression you might get from uh, a lot of the teams doing Scrum or Extreme Programming or Kanban or, or whatever it is, nothing about those processes is integral to, to to doing agile. In fact, you know the phrase "doing agile" doesn't even really really make sense. That's not what agile is about. This, this here is the, the Agile Manifesto in its, its entirety. Um, and if you strip away the boilerplate pieces, what you have is these four, these four value judgments, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. And 
none of this says anything about processes. It, it, it was really a reaction to the the values and the processes um, that were that were common at the time, and really did in sort of ways that uh, are a little bit subtle uh, lay the foundation for for what we do today. Um, if you if you're doing agile today in some capacity, that probably means you're, for example, using user stories. And that's a combination of valuing those individuals and interactions. Uh, if user story is, is about a certain individual interacting with the software in some way to uh, achieve some kind of means. But it's also, you could say, about customer collaboration because user stories are meant to be a conversation with the stakeholder or the client or the customer about how they want the software to uh, behave and what they need it to, to, what kind of problem they need it to solve. Agile also tends to imply some form of iterative development. Um, and that's that's generally about working software because it doesn't make sense to, to iterate if, you, if what you have doesn't work. Um, and, and also responding to change, moving in small steps so that uh, as, you, as you move forward, um, you, can, you can adjust your course uh, at a finer grain. You also see some other elements. Um, continuous integration is a common technique. Uh, that's, that's about uh, integrating uh, your working software constantly. Um, continuous deployment is another one. Um, that's sort of uh, about collaboration, um, customer collaboration, because they're getting to see the, the software more often, but it's also about responding to change in the same way. And, and none of those are necessarily core to Agile, but there, there's some of the ways that you can come at it. And, but the main thing is that there's no, there's no one size fits all process. Solace itself is kind of uniquely positioned. Um, in my experience in e-commerce, there's not a, another platform that lends itself to the common styles of agile development that that we see today um for example uh testing support ruby on rails the ruby on rails community loves tdd and testing and there's there's tons of tools around that and the and so it's 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 in many ways the default there um but but solidus doesn't stop there solidus offers factories and other testing support so that uh you're you can get up and running te writing tests for any kind of custom behavior that you happen to be adding to your application um, Continuous integration again, uh, Rails defaults to using Git um, and Rails is supported across all the major CI services that you might wanna use. So getting, uh, at least from a technical perspective, there's, there's, no, there's no reason you shouldn't be uh, integrating your changes regularly with the rest of your team and, and hopefully validating them with the test suite that you wrote um, for your application. Similarly, CD. Uh, Rails is well supported across all uh, most hosting platforms. Uh, all the, there's a, certainly a, a great ecosystem of them out there. And if you've already got your test suite and your CI set up and everything's good to go there, then that and continuous deployment is, is, is no sweat either. And finally, uh, I hesitated to add this one to the list, but I, I do think it, it belongs on here. Um, there's not like a technical feature really that makes user stories as a technique uh, pair well with Solidus, but Solidus is just so endlessly customizable that if if you're if you're picking up a user story to implement for a customer, and it's really complicated or has some really complex needs or or, or whatever it is, whether it's for a uh, customer experience that you need to build or something in the admin, there really isn't a limit there. So you're going to spend less time sort of fighting with um, what can be done on your platform uh, when it comes to, to implementing stories. So, so I do think that is in itself valuable. So the foundation is there. Um, there's no big hurdles that you need to overcome if you want to, you know, adopt an agile workflow on Solidus. But agile isn't some sort of you know performance art where we do it for the sake of doing it. There, there's a goal we're trying to deliver value through software efficiently and, and refine our ability to do that. And, and so you can drop in a common process and uh, depending on your, your organization or, or your project or your team, uh, you, you'll probably get pretty far. But 
but there's no like agile manifesto too that tells you you know once once you're you've adopted a bunch of processes that that show that you value um, these agile tenets, then um, what what do you do next to do this better? And and the proponents of agile talk about all these these huge gains, but but not every everyone sees them in in adopting uh, a diff, any given process. And that's that's where the agile fluency model comes in. Um, before I talk too much about it, um, I just wanted to be clear that. Uh, I'm not actually affiliated with uh, the Agile Fluency Project in any way. I'm not a licensed facilitator, I'm not trying to sell you on their, their products or workshops or whatever they do. Um, I, I came across this honestly, and after reading a bunch about it, it just fit really, it just really jived with how I look at this process of, of growing teams and, and, and how they progress through um, and, and build up uh, a really great efficient process that works for them. So the model sort of seeks to provide teams with a way to evaluate their agile process um, and, and look at what parts of the process they might want to focus on to, to really get the value out of agile that the agile proponents uh, say that you can. Because, um, you know, agile, these agile techniques are just tools for us to, to efficiently deliver software. And if, if they're not doing that, then we either need to to take a look at them or consider alternatives. So the, the model outlines four zones through which teams pass as they learn uh, and improve their process. And each one comes with its own benefits that you might expect to, to reap from focusing on it. Now, the first one, the first zone is called focusing. Um, and it's about producing business value. This is sort of the, the fundamental piece that you need in order to be you know, if if your team's not delivering business value in some way, then 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 you're uh, you're in trouble. Um, the, the the second zone is delivering, and and that's about how you deliver that value you're producing, whether you're um, you're delivering it when the business needs it, and and that kind of thing. Then you move on to optimizing. Optimizing is is more about emp further empowering the team to to help make decisions and, and, and really turning the team into, into leaders. And then finally you have strengthening and that, that one's a bit more speculative, um, but, but that's where teams work to, uh, to improve the broader organization through how they work. Um, now we could, we, could, we could just talk about the model and I'm sure everyone would learn something, but there's, there's lots of writing on, on the model itself and what I what interests me personally, and and I hope you, is, is how this actually applies to e-commerce projects. Um, e-commerce is a really unique space, and it's really different from from other kinds of product work. And as much as it's fast and varied, e-commerce projects tend to have a, a, a sort of a bunch of things in common. One of them is you've got customers. Um, your customers want to make purchases. Hopefully, they want to make purchases. If not, you're you're hoping they do anyway, um, you probably want them to make more purchases or larger purchases. And, and, and those are the kind of things you're, you're trying to get from your customers. But there's, there's a lot more to that. Um, you also probably have some form of customer service. Um, and, and this is where things get kind of a little interesting because customer service, they use the application in a way that's totally, completely separate from the customers. They have different needs. They have different uh, the different interface entirely, like it's a whole different thing. And, and, and the same applies when you get into the other groups of, uh, of people that might be using your software. You got merchandisers and marketers, you know, launching new products, running sales, all these other kinds of things. They're gonna be using, again, very different parts of the app than even customer services. And similarly, you see the same thing when you get into say fulfillment who, you know, if you've got in-house fulfillment or something might need to be using the application or, Accounting might need to run reports and things like that. And what you end up with is, is just a whole bunch of different groups of people that have, have totally different needs from your application. From, yeah, from your application. It's also a little tough for me to view e-commerce apps, specifically like storefronts, as just any other software project. 
like most software these days is, you know, it's going to be sold off as a, sold as a one-off purchase or as a subscription, or you're going to be, uh, you'll have a, you're building it for a client or there's some sort of licensing thing. And that's just like fundamentally different from e-commerce. You're not selling your software or access to your software. Instead, you've got all these different groups uh, of people who you could optimize your application for. Um, and only one of those groups is actually paying the bills on the project. Uh, and they interact with, like I said, a totally different part of the app than the other people. If you're optimizing for your, for your customers, uh, it's likely that you're not doing a lot for the other groups. So there, you know, there's certainly exceptions there. Um, unfortunately, those other groups, your fulfillment, your customer service, those people, um, they, they're going to have changing needs and uh, requirements. And some of them are going to be very business critical. Balancing that is, is not easy. And uh, well, I think the first zone uh, that we're going to talk about here is comparably easy to achieve for most teams. The later ones offer more significant challenges. Uh, and I'm going to sort of provide some, some thoughts on, on, on how that works. Um, and so, sort of the end of the day here is uh, if you've ever been on a team that's uh, it's really nailing this this kind of process and it's really succeeding. It, it, it's it's really fun to be on those kinds of teams and and that's where you really create a lot of value and and there's there's no reason not to strive for that. So this first zone, uh, like I said, it's called focusing. Um, the The basic idea is that a focusing team needs to go beyond you know working in silos and. Uh, focusing on sort of technical considerations and instead work as a, a as a team towards this shared benefit uh, shared um, objectives that benefit the stakeholders of the project if you're sort of doing scrum or kanban or or following the non-technical pieces of extreme programming then you probably already have fluency in this zone um, the techniques of backlogs or retros or sprints or task boards, they all help with this zone. Um, if, you're see, if you're succeeding in uh, this particular zone, it's, it's usually pretty easy to tell because um, you, you just need to evaluate. Are you, are you being transparent with your stakeholders um, about what's being worked on, about how it's progressing, and, and are your stakeholders, are the things that you're working on actually valuable to your stakeholders? Um, that's the, the sort of core way to evaluate um, your proficiency in this, this particular zone. Um, so if there's not visibility on the work that's being done and it, it doesn't reflect your business priorities, then, then this might be where you need to, to sort of put your effort to, to, to get the foundation there. So what hurdles are there for e-commerce teams in this particular zone? Um, so in my experience, established e-commerce organizations and sometimes organizations that um, are just branching into e-commerce, sometimes view the software team as just sort of this necessary evil, the sort of cost of doing business that um, they, they need to pay in order to, to be selling things on the internet. And with that, you, you get these, these sort of unfortunate arrangements where the software team is really just being handed off requirements and uh, as if there's just sort of like a, a tool uh, that the rest of the organization is using to actually get things done. Um, they're just really a middleman. So getting to the point where you're actually collaborating with your stakeholders can be a little bit tricky. Um, you need to first of all figure out who those stakeholders are because just because someone's handing you the the actual requirements doesn't mean they're the ones generating them and, and some work needs to go in to decide who who actually owns the different streams of work or priorities um and while that might not be particularly easy it's critical if you can't do that then uh then this is sort of a non-starter um once you have done that though Implementing one of the most com some of the most common agile techniques is, is, is really uh, the next step. So, um, and, and those are you know uh, those like Kanban or Scrum or or, or non technical XP or something like that. Um, and within this this zone, there there's um, there's a lot of room to improve that collaboration. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that just because you are 
you've dropped in the basic scrum pieces, you're now succeeding in that. You need to look at what's being worked on, how that compares with the business priorities. And if there's still a, if there's still a gap there, then it means you need to continue to invest in that sort of like core agile pieces, you know, your, how, how you're generating your user stories, those kinds of things. Um, but like I said, this isn't where the big hurdles are. There's certainly lots of reading you can go do on, on whichever process you happen to have chosen and, and how to, how to do it most effectively and lots of ways to evaluate how that's going. Um, and if you can get those fundamentals down, then you sort of have the, the first piece of, of a really successful, uh, agile process. And, and you should be able to point to the benefits of it. You should see, should be fewer mis misunderstandings because you're working directly with those stakeholders. Um, the engineering team is going to be better able to, to make suggestions around how to achieve goals because, you know, they're, they're involved in, in, in the, the why, not just the what, and the stakeholders should be able to intervene when the team is heading in the wrong direction. There are, uh, because this is just sort of the foundation, this is like the first piece of doing agile. Um, there's, there's, uh, I don't have a lot of, uh, Ecom specific tips here. Um, these processes work great in, in in these kinds of organizations if you can if you can slot them in. So uh, by all means, try that. Uh, the important thing is that you you involve those stakeholders. They need to be meaningfully involved, not just sort of technically in the meetings. They they're the they need to be generate helping you generate that work. And you also want to be working in some form of iteration. Um, that's that's important. Um, We'll get to some the more specific pieces of that later, but um, and, and you need to be tra transparent. If if you're not being transparent, if you're you know hiding progress or pretending there's more progress, things like that, then that is that is where you can get into trouble. Now let's talk delivering. This is where uh, teams aim not just to focus on the right goals, but on how they're delivering that value. Everything here sort of stems from trying to get to low defect rates, high productivity, which, you know, of course that sounds, I'm sure that sounds great to everyone. Um, it's not just focusing on business value, but on delivering it at whatever cadence makes sense for, for the market and the business. And um, one way you can think about this is that teams that are proficient in delivering differentiate themselves from teams that are just proficient in focusing by being able to ship at value at will. The, the Agile Fluency Project puts it like this, a team that can release their latest work at minimal risk and cost whenever the, uh, the, be, the business desires. So that sounds great. Um, I can't imagine uh, any stakeholders would say that sounds like a bad thing, um, but, but it's not necessarily obvious how to get there. Uh, fortunately, this is sort of the, while, while, while focusing is sort of the, the basic process piece that you need, um, this delivering is more the, the technical proficiencies that you need. So fortunately, extreme programming sort of gives us uh, a good framework. So if you're fluent in delivering, you're probably using a whole bunch of sort of XP techniques. Um, for example, you're gonna need continuous integration. Um, there's no way that you're going to get to the point where um, if a change is ready and validated and able to ship, if, unless you have, you know, a so solid acceptance tests and uh, and um, are integrating your work regularly, um, in order to you know lower the risk and increase the con uh, confidence you have in your releases and that value being delivered, you'll almost certainly be doing something like TDD or at least a significant amount of automated testing because. Um, it's just not feasible to to you know manually validate every change, and you also be really really focusing on refactoring the system because as as uh, requirements evolve, you different parts of the system may drift and become uh, out of sync with each other. And if you're going to be able to easily make, continuously make changes, you really need to pay down that debt and make sure that. Uh, the, the system stays uh, congruent. The other thing, um, not so much XP related, but um, that you'll need is you'll probably steal some stuff from the DevOps movement. Um, continuous delivery 
is a big one. Um, using things like feature flags and that kind of thing to to allow for for changes to be merged and deployed and tested and ready to go when the business needs them. So continuous delivery, continuous deployment is going to be be pretty clutch there. Um, we just we already discussed all those things, and, and in some ways, they're they're some of the the bread and butter benefits of being on Solidus. Um, from a technical perspective, many of them are basically the defaults. Um, the trick here is that um, you don't just need to be doing them. You need to actually be good at them. So um, just because you have a CI, you know, CI server set up and you're automatically deploying to a staging or production environment or something like that, doesn't mean that you're you know, effective at doing that. Maybe you're still dealing with really large, long-lived feature branches or, um, or something like that. Th those are the kinds of things that um, you might be in some sense going through the, the motions, but unless you actually move towards these techniques and, and invest in getting really good at them, feature flags is another good example, getting really good at working with feature flags and, and handling that within your process, um, then you're not actually gonna get the benefit uh, from, from, from this zone. But the, the, the trick here is within your organization, you, you need the time to invest in these. Getting really good at them takes time. It takes more time than dropping in Scrum and, and getting up to speed on it. So your organization is going to need to understand that there's going to be a bit of energy that's going to need to be put towards um, the, the processes and the techniques in here if you're going to succeed at them. And that said, on the flip side of this, um, they, this all pairs really well with e-commerce. Um, e-commerce projects can typically, like most software projects can't typically make tons and tons of changes really quickly for fear of alienating their users. But for most stores, you can, you can often deliver features pretty much as fast as you can build them. So it's sort of up to the business, um, when you launch them, um, there are certainly exceptions, but uh, for most stores that um, that you see, people aren't coming back many times per day to make additional purchases. So uh, a little bit of churn and change in, in how things work isn't liable to be significantly detrimental to the experience. Um, so in this zone, uh, the, the main focus here is it's not just about doing you know, code review or CI or any of these pieces we're about to talk about. It's about doing them well. You need to actually invest in these techniques so that you can get value out of them. Code review is one that comes up constantly. Code review is not like j just because someone looks at the code and hits approve doesn't mean that you're actually doing code review in any meaningful way. And there are a lot of skills related to this. I'm, I think maybe Nebulab has a blog post on this, but um, you know, being able to write good PR descriptions is really important. Being able to structure the commits and author those commits really well is going to go a long ways to, to good code review. And then how the people actually doing the code review approach it is also super, super important. TDD and testing is another one. Like, you know, pretty much never run into Solidus apps that don't have some kind of test suite, though it does happen. Um, but the, the reality is, you know, testing is a skill and it's a technique that, that you can get better at and there is more value in it, the better you get at it. So just because you, you're writing tests doesn't mean you're necessarily getting a ton of value out of those tests you're writing. So, so investing in that's a big one. Continuous integration is another one. You know, if you're, if you're still running long lived feature branches with tons of commits in them, you know, uh, that's, that means you're not necessarily like, you know, you might have a CI server that's regularly validating all those changes, but but that's not really the same thing as really effectively doing uh, CI. Same thing with continuous delivery. Um, this is where you start getting into feature flags, things like that, being able to, to continually deliver features and then turn them on as, as the business needs them. And finally, aggressive refactoring. Um, being able to spot the areas in your system that are that are drifting apart and where the concepts aren't lining up anymore, and, and aggressively going after those. It's it's it is again another real skill that that's sometimes not uh, completely articulated. So, if you've got those two foundational pieces down, if you're you're delivering business value, you've got to the point where 
you're delivering at a cadence that, that works for your business, then you get to the really hard part and that's, that's optimizing. Um, and this is, this is the big differentiator for a lot of teams. Um, if your team is proficient in this zone, then, then you're actually getting those benefits out of Agile that, that Agile's proponents talk about. This is, this is Agile's promise. Um, and that's, that's essentially higher, higher value deliveries and better product decisions. Uh, it's about knowing what your market and your business needs and, and achieving that. And it is way harder to achieve in e-commerce than those other zones. This, you know, you've already got the technical foundation from delivering. Now we need to optimize what's getting delivered. And, and this is where teams tend to fall down. And, and I honestly don't blame them. Uh, the Agile Fluency Project says the distinction between an optimizing team and a delivering team is that the optimizing team makes its own decisions about what to fund and where to focus their efforts. And uh, in e-commerce, you've got all these different internal needs pulling you every direction and you still need to keep the customer top of mind and, and succeeding here is going to require a lot of trust between the engineering team and the rest of the organization. But, but that level of trust that has to be built up across, um, you know, through, through the other zones. Um, it, it's really a prerequisite to, to what you need here. So optimizing, it's already a word that comes up a lot in e-commerce. Um, we do A-B tests and customer interviews and all kinds of things, try and try and suss out, you know, a, a little, uh, a, a way to squeeze a little boost in our conversion rate or AOV or, or whatever. Um, and, and so it's, it's sort of interesting that if you're going to, you know, if you're going to succeed in e-commerce, you, you need your team to be working in sync with the other parts of the organization. And that's where the optimization comes in here. If um, I, I, for example, encountered teams that were, that were expecting to, I think they're expected to own the bounce rate or something of certain landing pages, but, but they didn't, they weren't actually working with the marketing team. So like the, out of nowhere, the bounce rate would tank and well, it turns out marketing to just send a whole bunch of traffic to one of those pages, uh, but it was really low quality traffic. So, so it was, it was bouncing and well, like no, that kind of disconnect is, is a really a blocker for, for achieving this next level. No amount of playing with which metrics you care about is going to address that kind of disconnect between the, the engineering portion and the rest of the organization. So uh, that's, that's where this gets tricky. Um, fixing these kinds of problems and, and getting proficient in this area typically involves actual structural change within organizations. Um, working with, um, working from the outside as a consultant, like I've done, um, this is, this is, you know, those other two pieces we can, we can get there. We have the, those proficiencies, but when it gets to here, you really need the organization on board. Um, and you need to be integrated into the organization. So it is, it is more difficult for, for, but not impossible for, for agencies as well. Um, segments of the organization, um, I'm thinking like product, fulfillment, marketing, merchandising, customer service maybe, um, they need to be potentially like partially integrated into the development team, not, not just as stakeholders, but in some sort of more meaningful way that um, you're more involved in their decision-making. And, and, and that's the big thing. Involving, uh, involving the engineering team in the parts of the organization that they're impacting is just necessarily going to lead to better decision making. It, it's it's honestly like night and day in some organizations. Uh, the the flip from when you start getting um, those people involved in, in that kind of dis decision making is is really really leads to much better decisions. You get like low low value projects suddenly they get they get canceled or pivoted early because, you know, you, you can immediately see from the stakeholders and working with them towards those same goals that the things aren't working out or this isn't going to solve the problem. You get uh, higher value projects immediately get prioritized or, or additional resources as needed. Um, and, and it generally just improves the, the, the broader team's ability to evaluate and, and prioritize goals. Um, but the, the more context, the better. The tough piece here, though, is that um, this is like, like we talked about sort of the, the difficulties in laying down um, 
the fundamental pieces in focusing and how you have to sort of reevaluate and rearrange how your engineering team is looked at within the organization. This is like flipping the entire thing on its head. This requires that you actually give the engineering team more decision-making power within the organization. Um, and you're, you might get pushback from that. If you, if you haven't uh, laid down the, a good foundation of trust here, then, then this is just going to fall apart for you. Um, so what, what do you need to do here? Well, you need to integrate stakeholders from other parts of the country into your process. Um, there's, there's really no way around that. That has, that has to be done. You've hopefully, you've hopefully identified your stakeholders. You've hopefully built up trust as you've continued to continuously deliver value as the business needs it. Things, things are going smoothly. Now is when you need to sort of push for, for broader change so that you can do do your jobs even more effectively. Um, metrics are a fun one. Um, you see a lot of e-com teams focusing on things like uh, AOV or conversion, uh, revenue per request is a fun one. Um, sort, of a, sort of a different way to look at things. I really like it. Um, but those really only apply to, to the customer experience, um, to the bottom line. If, uh, a good example is, um, the returns and exchanges flow in Solidus as it currently exists. Um, it, in every organization that we've used it, it has met the needs of the organization, but because it is very flexible and, and, and there's a lot you can do, it, it sort of maps very well to a lot of the use cases without too much customization. But I don't think that, for example, the time it takes to process a return was top of mind when it was designed take something like 18 clicks or something something ridiculous like that. Uh, it, it's really not very good. And it's something we've had to optimize before for certain stores. And um, that's just, that's an easy one. Like, of course, you know, any reasonable sized organization is going to process a lot of returns and they're going to want to be able to do those quickly and efficiently, especially um, in organizations where most of those returns sort of, they follow the, the same basic path. Um, so, so consider, consider where metrics make sense. Now, obviously for a lot of projects, metrics aren't, aren't the right tool, but um, we're already using them with any, any e commerce pretty much uh, in all organizations. So we might as well uh, help us help give us uh, better ideas of how to prioritize things. And finally, this is because this is the most difficult proficiency. You need to be able to show off the wins that you get from it. Um, Metrics are a great one, you know, smooth launches, things like that. Uh, you want to you want to make sure that you're communicating the value you're getting off out of these processes. Because if if your stakeholders, if the other parts of the organization aren't seeing the value, um, then then the effort of making these kinds of organizational changes is. Uh, it's, it's just not going to, to work. It takes a lot of energy. And if that energy doesn't look like it's uh, leading to good outcomes, then, then you might get pushed back. And finally, we get to strengthening. Um, this is how the project, uh, the Agile Fluency project describes it. Um, I've certainly seen uh, how some teams can sort of strengthen the organizations that they're in. Um, but this, like I said, is the sort of more speculative piece. This is where... Um, uh, this is where the sort of bleeding edge of agile is. And uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm not going to lie to you and claim that I, I know exactly where it fits into e-commerce. I could probably toss a bunch of bud buzzwords together and pretend I do, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so, so let's recap. Um, there's four zones to consider. You've got focusing, delivering, optimizing, strengthening. If you're not yet focusing, that probably needs, uh, you're not yet on your Agile journey, um, or you've just started it, this is where you need to get those sort of fundamental foundations down so that you can, um, you can have a sort of solid project management basis that's actually directing the project towards the, the features that matter. Once you achieve that, uh, delivering is next thing on the plate. Um, that start, that's investing in your process, your technical process, so that you can, uh, you can deliver more efficiently. And then once you've got all that down, or at least running smoothly, it's time to consider how your team fits into the broader organization so that you can continue to, to evolve and improve how you work. Um, 
now that we've outlined that, I, I really have, I just have two tips that I want to leave you with. Uh, first of them is beware bad investments. You need to, the, this, this framework doesn't let you just sort of be like, oh yeah, like, I, I think we need to do that thing. Let's, let's put, pour some money into CICD so that we can, you know, ship faster. Um, if you get sign off and put tons of effort into one segment of this process, but you're, you're failing at the, the segments, like the zones before it, or, or the fundamental pieces, then all you're going to do is undermine trust in what you're doing. You need, you need, and you need that trust to, to eventually, um, succeed overall. Um, essentially you need to be agile about your agile process too. Evaluate where you're putting the energy in, what you're getting out, and continue to adjust as you go. This isn't this doesn't tell you the answers; it just points you in the right direction. The other tip, um, and, and I've sort of touched on this, is that, that Solidus is perfectly suited for everything we've discussed. I don't think there's another platform that's as good in this regard. Um, if you are f comfortable with the processes and techniques that we're talking about here, then by all means, you should be trying to implement them out the gate on your next Solidus project. There's no reason you shouldn't be doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, code review, unless you don't have, you know, unless you're a really small team uh, of one. Um, they're building a test suite. All the tools are there. Refactoring, by all means, and, and collaborating with your stakeholders. There's, there's nothing stopping you from doing any of these pieces, and there couldn't be a better platform for you to be on. So... Because you're using Solidus, you might as well make the best of it. So that's it for me. Um, this is my Twitter email web. You can uh, uh, you can find me. Feel free to give me a shout on the Solidus Slack. I'm always answering people's questions and stuff, and uh, and say happy birthday to to my real cute dog that uh, turned five today. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jared. That was amazing. Uh, so Jared's going to be hanging out in the Q and A session for a few minutes. Uh, go ask some questions. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, that marks the end of day two of the conference. Uh, once again, thank you so much for attending and showing your support for the platform. Day three is tomorrow, and that's our traditional hack day. Uh, we're going to spend we're going to spend some time working on the core of Solidus together, and we're also going to have an open stakeholders meeting uh, at ten a.m. Central. Uh, so be sure to, to attend that if you're interested in seeing how Solidus is run. Uh, once again, I'll be having some drinks in the After Hours Lounge, so come say hi, and we'll see everybody tomorrow. Bye.